Hello, folks, and welcome to the Backstage Community Sessions for Adopters. This is our monthly meetup uh, where we talk all things uh, backstage, adoption, new cool things. Um, we have uh, quite a few things uh, today, so I'm not going to dwell too long. Um, but first, I want to wish you welcome and let you know that we have three demos coming up today uh, of newly uh, announced plugins, which is totally awesome. Uh, but first, we have Ben on the show, and Ben, if you don't know him, is one of our maintainers. Hello, Ben. Hello. So, what do you have to share today? Uh, yeah, so we did our uh, 1.10 release yesterday, uh, and then a little small bonus release of 1.10.1, because we broke a few things. Um, but I can kind of step through what we did yesterday, uh, what we've been working on for the past um, few months, uh, from the community point of view, and from what we've been doing as maintainers. Um, yeah, so we have deprecated the create plugin part for Yarn now. So if you're using that inside your own uh, repo, uh, we have shipped a new thing which is called Yarn New instead. Um, it involves just updating your package JSON with the new Backstage CLI script. So not too much to do there. Um, it's all in the change log as well if you need to go and read that. Um, we've been working on splitting some things apart with the scaffolder. Um, you might have heard there's a new version of the scaffolder coming or scaffolder next is what it's called internally at the minute. We haven't really spoke so much about this just yet. We're kind of waiting for some dependencies to stabilize first um, before we kind of um, write some experiment, uh, experimental documentation on how to get set up and running with that. Um, but in what we've been running on, what we've been working on, sorry, is to kind of move some things out into a scaffolder React package, which is going to make things a little bit easier to share components across uh, the uh, scaffolder landscape, I guess. So if you want to use some of the components in the scaffolder, for instance, you want to show like template cards in different places, you can do that now without depending on the scaffolder plugin itself. Um, there's also been a new uh, Sentry module for the scaffolder as well. So you can now create some Sentry projects. Um, what else have we done? We let me. I've got the release notes here. I'm just kind of going through as well. Um, we've been looking at moving uh, some of our repo tooling out of the main mono repo for use for in other places. So maybe be that your own repos if you want to take advantage of some of the API report stuff that we do inside of our uh, repo. Then you can go ahead and use that that stuff. Um, yes, more scaffold improvements um, that we can now have examples in the actions as well. So you can now provide um, like example YAML uh, manifests for people to actually see when they're browsing the actions. Um, and we've also deprecated some of the allowed kinds. Uh, so you might have seen if you're using like the entity picker or the owner picker, we have an allowed kinds option, which you can define in YAML. We've deprecated that in favor of um, a catalog filter instead. So you can filter a little bit more than just the allowed like kinds itself. You can filter whatever you like inside the catalog spec. Um, we've been working on the backend system still as well. We're kind of making a lot of good progress on that. We've been making some great progress over the last few weeks. So you'll see there's a lot of changes that's going on there. More info to come on that uh, in the next few weeks as well. Um, and yes, event-based updates for the entity, uh, the GitHub org entity provider. So we can now um, react to webhooks for changes in the organization in GitHub and then reflect that in the catalog. Um, yeah, that's kind of a quick whistle stop tour. Uh, thank you to everybody involved in making this release work and getting it across the line, maintainers and contributors alike. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this. And uh, well, you know, a breaking release, that never happens. So it's uh, it's okay to uh, to be quick and uh, and fix it. And we get a bonus version. So that's uh, that's really a good thing. Um, next up, uh, one of the announcements that um, that we uh, saw uh, on the socials in the uh, past week, it was, um, was an announcement um, from Reddit that there was a key cloak plugin released for Backstage. And I found Andrew, um, and he's on the show today to tell us more about that. Andrew, hi, so nice to join us. Hey, how's everyone doing today? Well, I'm doing good. I think the people in the chat too. I think everybody's really curious about uh, about this uh, this new plugin. Uh, but first, uh, for the people who are unfamiliar, uh, what is Keycloak? Keycloak is a open source identity and access management tool. So you can use it to either federate multiple identity sources from social logins like GitHub, Google, Microsoft, or other OIDC providers. Or you know, for many of my customers, maybe LDAP in on-premise environments. So it provides that nice single 
source of truth that you can make use of in modern applications. So backstage obviously being one of them. Obviously. Um, so that's so cool. So yeah, please uh, share more uh, share more about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a presentation. It. I'm going to quickly get if that's all right. And then yeah. obviously, most importantly, show it. Yes. I think that's, that's where we're all here. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let me know if you can see my screen. I'm coming up in a second. Yes, it's there. I see. All right. I'm gonna awesome. That. Fantastic. So let me go ahead and quickly share. So we're going to quickly talk about Keycloak and Backstage integration. So Backstage does have a, an entire framework for representing identities in the software catalog, which you can use for authentication to enable logins to users based on existing identities in external systems. You can then also associate those identities to entities stored within Backstage, and that governs access to the ability to look at different things in the software catalog. Now, there are a number of different plugins out there, right, or providers, uh, available for Backstage, everything from Azure, Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, and there's a whole bunch there that you can integrate with. And it's great because it allows you to take your existing identity store and bring it into the Backstage ecosystem. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Keycloak is that open source access and identity manager that can allow you to federate all your identity needs from existing external sources, or you can use Keycloak itself to manage your entire users. So you don't even need to have an external source to be able to use within your application. And it's extensible. It's one of the best parts about being an open source project is not only can you use the base features, but you can also extend it using a, a number of plugins and extension points. It's really good. Um, if you haven't used it, definitely check it out. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite tools out there since I spend a lot of time in the security space. Now, you can, the best part about it is you can easily authenticate against Keycloak using Backstage because Backstage includes an OAuth2 proxy provider, which allows any OIDC-based provider to be integrated into the Backstage ecosystem. So all you need to do is set up this OAuth2 proxy in front of your Backstage instance and then configure it to point to Keycloak and it will go ahead and allow you to authenticate against Keycloak and bring in your different users into, at least allow you to log in to Backstage. One of the key difference, differentiators between a OAuth2 proxy provider and other providers like GitHub or GitLab is that you have to set up your own sign-in resolver. That will allow you to map an existing user within the software catalog, or you can actually bypass that completely and just create a user on the fly to be able to log in. Now, resolving users usually uh, involves having to map it to an existing uh, entity within the catalog. And how do you get those entities in? In most cases, you're going to synchronize them from an external source. So like Azure, GitHub, and LDAP, there's existing integrations through a backend provider to synchronize users in groups. Or if it's a uh, GitHub organization, it's going to be a team into a backstage group. Now, all these, plug all these um, backend plugins are available within Backstage, but they're not installed by default. So as you are going ahead and customizing your Backstage instance, you're gonna to have to install that plugin and configure it as well. So what we also have, aside from being able to authenticate into Keycloak from Keycloak, we can also ingest users and groups from Keycloak into the Backstage catalog. So you can take your existing identity stores, whether it be within Keycloak itself or pulled in through Keycloak from an external source into the Backstage catalog, which allows you to really abstract all of the um, your identity needs. So you just point at Keycloak, and Keycloak kind of does the rest. So how do you go ahead and integrate the in the Backstage backend catalog into Keycloak into Backstage? First of all, you want to go ahead and number one configure access to Keycloak. You need to go ahead and use either a standard user or a service account to allow uh, Backstage to communicate with Keycloak. You need to then customize your Backstage instance by adding the backend plugin. You need to register the plugin within the catalog, within the back the backend component of Backstage. And then finally, add the configuration in the app config.yaml. 
Now, all of this work is being, being kind of championed by a upstream project called Janus. And Janus is an initiative to provide new capabilities to the Bass State ecosystem. There are really four areas that the project Janus is looking to target. Uh, first of all, it's deployment targets and uh, installation methods. We want to enhance and develop new plugins. We want to look into golden paths and templates. And then obviously all of this is just incorporating improvements to the entire backstage ecosystem. And what we're looking to do from a upstream community standpoint around Janus is in our, on our roadmap this year, obviously we talked a little bit about the Keycloak plugin. Uh, there's going to be another plugin that we're, a set of plugins that uh, Tom is going to talk about a little later on around multi-cluster management. Uh, Red Hat Quay is a, or Quay and Quay.io is a uh, large uh, image registry, which you can then leverage uh, like a Kubernetes environment or not Kubernetes environment. Uh, and then uh, Janus is an upstream community project sponsored by Red Hat. You're going to also look into some Red Hat specific uh, capabilities around OpenShift. Uh, everything from OpenShift pipelines built on the upstream Tecton project and OpenShift GitOps, which is built on the upstream Argo CD project. And if you're interested in learning more about this, I'm going to give a demo in a minute, but if you're interested in learning more about the Keycloak integration, you can look at uh, the Project Janus uh, GitHub organization. We have a set of plugins in the Janus dash IDP organization called Backstage Plugins. If you want to learn more about Project Janus, you can look, go to, the, as I mentioned, the Janus IDP organization. And then we have a couple of articles that we are currently uh, pushed out there to the Janus project blog that has more information about not only the integrations that we're going to discuss today, but also some of the other great efforts that are going on in the Janus community. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and actually show some demos. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go in and show you Keycloak. This is Keycloak, the identity management tool. We have a number of realms, which is basically spaces where you can configure users and authentication and access. I created this one called Backstage. And we have a set of users and groups. We have a set of dummy users, but I also have one for myself because I'm an administrator, and which, which means I'm part of the admin section. So you'll see I'm in here. And if we go back to groups again, you'll see we have the other user, user one, user two inside here. Let's go ahead and try to authenticate against Backstage. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my Backstage instance. And you'll see it takes me directly to Keycloak to be able to log in. I will go in and authenticate using my user account. And by that, I have a simple backstage instance. This, this is a very empty catalog. It has nothing really in it. It's basically just a dummy, you know, just basically the boilerplate backstage instance. But as you see here, by looking at the user who has been logged in, you'll see it pulled my username, it pulled my email address, but it also pulled my ownership details. So it's, it shows that I'm part of the admins group. So if I want to go ahead and log in as the user, like user one, user two, you would see a totally different group. So we can pull in that identity and information and perform role-based access control and access to different resources within the Backstage catalog. So you have a lot of cool options out there. You see that we easily pulled that in and can leverage a lot of the capabilities around Backstage. I know this was a lot to take in, but I definitely welcome any questions that anyone has from the audience. And otherwise, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Yeah, and so, thank you so much, Andrew, for, for being here and sharing the, the work that, that you've all been, already been doing. But also, what an impressive list that is that you showed with the, for the Janus IDP uh, project. Great ideas up our sleeves, and we've already started working on some cool things with not only within the project, but also in the backstage community. Yeah, and that's great to see, and it's a very nice roadmap. I think that we will be inviting you a few times more into this community uh, session, if that's uh, if that's okay with uh, with you. If there's any questions, I take it people can ask them uh, uh, also in the in the chat. Um, hopefully, you will uh, stick around a little bit here. Absolutely. Um, 
Thank you so much. So next up is uh, is another uh, announcement, and that is about the uh, um, open cluster management plugin for uh, Backstage. Um, and they call it the multi-cluster engine uh, plugin. And for that, we have Tom on the show. I have new glasses, so I'm, I'm trying to find the right person here. Please bear with me. They say this is over in two weeks, but who knows? There he is. Yes. Success. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Hello, Tom. Thank you for being on the show. It is thank like somehow everything is a blur. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for, for being on the show. Um, one of the, the things that uh, that uh, indeed was announced is the uh, uh, multi-cluster plugin. So I did a little digging and it is about the OCM. Now the OCM, that, that's mainly used in OpenShift. Is that right? Not just OpenShift, but it's an open source community community project. Um, there are various other clouds providers that are using that. Uh, but yes, we use it in, in OpenShift lands, uh, landscape as well. Um, so yes. OK, well, can you share more about what, what this plugin is doing? Definitely. Um, I also have it in my presentation, in my few slides, but um, as, as a Generic overview, high level overview. Uh, open cluster management is a community project uh, that focuses on um, managing clusters, uh, but not just that. So, uh, if I can move my slides, here we go. Uh, you can find it on the open cluster management.io, uh, and it focuses on multiple different areas on a, um, as a self sustained, self managed uh, multi cluster and multi cloud. Um, management tool so uh, if you find yourself in a situation um, like having tens of different clusters kubernetes clusters that you would like to manage uh, you would like to deploy you would like to uh, retire maybe upgrade uh, this may be the tool for you um, so it manages your cluster lifecycle but also it allows you to enforce different enforce different policies across all these clusters and it also allows you to uh, manage applications and distribute applications across these clusters and so on and so on. So again, uh, as Andy showed with Keycloak, it's, uh, ex that was an extensible system. This is also a very extensible system with uh, various add-ons, uh, how to simplify your uh, multi-cluster management life. Um, so in this um, particular uh, talk, uh, we're going to focus on how to integrate this particle a bit uh, with Backstage and why would you want to do that? Um, so as a phase one that we chose was to basically uh, get your clusters, get your landscape of, of, of cluster fleet into modeled in a Backstage catalog. So uh, imagine you have applications in your uh, Backstage catalog as you probably do, uh, and you want to um, you want to find those relations, find those uh, define those connections uh, that this particular application is deployed on cluster A, and this other application is deployed on cluster B. And what does it mean uh, resource wise? What does it mean uh, dependency wise? So, uh, for example, if a cluster break breaks, uh, you can draw uh, conclusions of what applications may break uh, in in that sense as well. This is not a new concept in uh, in Backstage itself. Um, there are various other plugins that are modeling clusters um, as entities in, in Backstage catalog. Uh, one that comes to my mind is Rody's plugin for AWS um, clusters, uh, Kubernetes clusters. So uh, we kind of uh, follow that pattern uh, in, our, in our plugin as well. Uh, before we dig into the details of the plugin itself, um, let's maybe share a bit how the open cluster management works and how the multi cluster engine in it works. The multi cluster engine, as I'm reiterating this all, all over again, is the part in open cluster management that is handling uh, management of cluster lifecycle, management of cluster provisioning, and uh, keeping them in sync, up to date, uh, healthy, and so on. Uh, the model is um, as shown on this picture, um, the architecture is very simple. You have one centralized hub cluster, uh, which is hosting the uh, open cluster management control plane, and various individual uh, managed clusters are pulling the desired state from this hub cluster and pushing status updates back. Um, so 
this is a very straightforward model. And uh, if we take a look how it's modeled inside uh, the Kubernetes cluster, the, the inside the hub cluster, uh, it's modeled as Kubernetes resources, as custom resources of kind, managed cluster, managed cluster info, and so on and so on. Um, so that should be fairly straightforward to translate to backstage catalog, right? Uh, we have this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Rodi plugin for AWS. We have this. Uh, we have this uh, example how this can be modeled in backstage already. So um, it can be modeled as a resource entity with a specific type of Kubernetes cluster, and this is um, this is kind of a pattern uh, that is already recognized in backstage. So we want to translate this. Uh, what comes to my what comes to mind of uh, people who would like to implement something like this is, hey, Backstage has a Kubernetes plugin. Why not to use that, right? Um, so we explored that path, but we decided that there might be uh, various concerns to, to address before we do that. Uh, so we offer both ways. Uh, Kubernetes plugin, if we want to um, leverage uh, utilities and, and you know all the, all the good things that Kubernetes plugin uh, gives us in Backstage, um, by default, all the clusters um, managed through Kubernetes plugin are visible in UI, uh, which may not always be the case if you want to if you want to scrape your hub cluster for for uh, all the various available clusters, and uh, you just want to uh, ingest those into catalog, but not make those workloads uh, generally uh, generally available to all the users. Um, and since the catalog ingestion happens in back, uh, in backend as a backend task, um, you can't use uh, any um, identity providers to authenticate against the hub cluster. You need to use a service account, uh, which may bring some RBAC concerns. Uh, what kind of information, what kind of access you want to share uh, for your hub cluster? Therefore, we offer uh, two ways of uh, configuring the, this. You either define the cluster uh, connection details directly for uh, for our plugin, or you can point to the Kubernetes configuration if you decide that this method is suitable for you. So you don't need to redefine uh, you don't need to redefine that particular configuration section, and you, you can reuse the Kubernetes plugin. Um, so. As of today, we can model um, clusters as catalog entities. Uh, we can provide some basic information uh, about individual clusters as backstage front-end components on the entity page for the resource for that resource particular one. Um, about like if the status is up and available, what is the connection details, where you can find that cluster console, and so on and so on. Uh, we want to expand on that. We want to provide information like how many nodes the cluster has available and, and you know, what's the current utilization of the cluster and so on. Uh, and as a next step, we would like to integrate this uh, natively with the Kubernetes plugin for um, user interactions with those individual clusters. So users can explore those individual clusters with their own credentials, um, not uh, through not through um, hub, not through uh, service account credentials passed to, a, passed to a hub cluster. So uh, I think uh, now is the time to start uh, showing you what I've actually been talking about and, and what does it mean. Uh, if, <laughs> if you want to know more about this plugin, um, under this particular link, um, I can share, uh, I can share in the chat maybe. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you for that link. You can find documentation to this plugin, and you can just simply add it to your to your um, individual applications to the backend, to the front end, and so on. This plugin is also part of the project Janus, uh, so um, you can find more information about it there. Uh, and with that, we can see how this how this actually uh, happens and what does it actually do. Uh, so. Imagine we have a hub cluster. This is a hub cluster uh, which has this list of multiple different clusters attached to it. 
Uh, we can check it uh, here as well. Uh, here we go. Uh, we have two, four, six, eight clusters. They have some API uh, URL. They have availability status and whatnot, uh, and so on and so on. Um, attached infrastructure provider version upgrades available and whatnot. So we want to ingest those into, into our catalog. So what our uh, plugin does, it defines a um, entity provider and a task scraping that Kubernetes API on the hub, hub cluster, fetching these resources and translating them into uh, resources on uh, within, the, within the backstage catalog as kind resource and we can dig into individual uh, cluster here and we can see some basic cluster information. We can see its current status. Uh, we can see some resource allocations and we have some quick actions uh, how to get directly into that particle cluster console uh, or how to um, view this uh, cluster in the OCM console. Um, so right now I'm accessing the small cluster directly um, and it's just one click away for me uh, on this entity page. Uh, I get also a very, very bare bones currently uh, overview of all the clusters available with their, uh, with their respective statuses. So I can directly see if my clusters are behaving or not. Um, so this, as I said, it's implemented as a basic entity provider. Uh, which uh, translates all those resources into uh, into resource uh, entity of, of resource type. So if I go to uh, any of these uh, resources, you can actually see it's a resource with this name and this links and, and, and whatnot and so on. So that's that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> That's really amazing. Uh, if you have any questions for Tom, by the way, put them in the chat. Um, I, I had a, a question. This this re looks really great. Um, I noticed that you were using in your demo uh, operate first. Can can you maybe share something about that? Because I think that maybe not a lot of people in this uh, meetup know about it. Yes, uh, operate first is an um, open community uh, community which hosts. Uh, I Community Cloud, uh, which is a um, bunch of clusters readily available for a free consumption uh, for your open source projects. Uh, so it's a community focused on SRE work and on uh, opening up the space of uh, ideas exchange and, and knowledge exchange, knowledge share uh, in the SRE space, uh, which is currently quite limited uh, in the open source world because each of us is taking open source applications, open source projects as code base, packaging it ourselves, deploying it ourselves. And uh, we don't really share how we are doing that and how we are handling uh, um, the SRE work afterwards. Um, so this community is focusing on that particle stage of, uh, of application lifecycle. And it allows you in their uh, operate first community cloud to um, deploy any of your applications um, in public cloud, um, get it across to your uh, community um, members and, and let it be used and let it be uh, experienced by other, other community members. So if you head over to operate first.cloud, operate-first.cloud, you can find more about this community. Yeah, the link is, uh, is in, the, in the chat. Um, so, and on Operate First, you actually use Backstage. Yes, yes. So we have, the best um, the best demo site probably out there. We have hopefully <laughs> we have um, we're trying to map the applications that we deploy to Operate First Community Cloud as uh, into a Backstage catalog. Um, so um, we want to use backstage as our promotion tool and our advertisement tool for all the community projects out there i know it's not the it's not the most mainstream use case of backstage out there uh but uh it works very well for us as an advertisement tool and and we're very happy with that so yes 
we use it quite a lot. Cool. So um, yeah, check it. Check that also out. Um, and uh, yeah, once again, this is really really great work. Um, uh, Marcos uh, was uh, in the chat and uh, asked uh, which real life use cases only have one has one cluster. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please uh, feel invited anytime to uh, jump on the show for uh, for another demo. We love demos, and uh, it really, really looks promising, the work that you're doing. Uh, and you're just getting started, right? So, Yes, we want to expand this further, add observability, add application management, maybe, um, or, um, yeah, there are many ideas uh, around. And um, as Andy uh, shared with what we are trying to build with Project Janus, uh, there are many backstage ideas as well, um, other than, uh, other than uh, open um, cluster management tool. So, yes. Yeah, it's amazing to see how, how this can, can drive adoption of open source tooling um, and also like adding a bit more abstraction uh, when needed. Um, it's really cool to see that happening. So keep up the good work and uh, we'll keep an eye out on uh, Project Janus and everything that's uh, that's happening in there. Thank you so much for being here, Tom. Thank you for having me. So next up is uh, another uh, plugin, which was uh, um, which which popped up in the uh, community session issue. Um, and Ivan is here to tell more about it. And it's all about um, S3 buckets and exploring them. Yeah, so hello, everybody. I'm Ivan. Uh, yeah, this is the plugin, as you can see in the, the screen share. Uh, so basically, we were working on a, we had a different tool to, to display all the buckets and the data inside. And since we started to use Backstage already almost a year ago, uh, the first tests at least, uh, yeah, so we are moving things forward to, from our old tool into to backstage and yeah this is one of the first plugins we open sourced i have already made the bold plugin as well maybe some people is using it uh, so yeah uh, i will go through the readme file you have some information basically it's this repo and you have a back back end front end and a common package inside and yeah you have some the front-end plugin you have a, a small overview of how it would look like uh, it's really simple to install like every every plugin uh, basically you set the uh, install the plugin and add it to a pad and the backend is the most complex one because there are so many things already uh, mm, the installation is also really simple i would say uh, then we have the configuration. Uh, maybe it looks familiar because it's based on the Kubernetes uh, plugin. We have a similar idea in, in how to develop that. And yeah, uh, basically you have to define the platforms you want to include. And then you have, uh, you see these allowed buckets uh, for security reasons, uh, we thought that a uh, whitelist would be safer than a block a blacklist and yeah uh, you can add all the for each endpoint you have or each cluster as you name it uh, you can add all the package you want good points here uh, you can use a uh, regex patterns instead of the whole name so it might save a lot of lines in there and then we have a lot of uh, elements to to fetch the packets to fetch the uh, the credentials to actually make the uh, API calls to, to the S3. And all this information can be customized. In uh, There's a lot of information here about how to do it. You have, for example, the S3 client, the buckets provider, uh, which is the one that it's fetching the buckets. Yeah, as the name said. Then we have this, uh, this is something we couldn't really make it and we added it as a, a thing that everyone can use it if they want. Uh, as an example, uh, the S3 API, it doesn't return, or in our case at least, doesn't return the the statistics. So, so to say the size of the bucket, how many elements are inside, 
but we have an endpoint using a, a Rados gateway. So we can get this data and it's something that has to be done by the by the users itself. And yeah, there's also possible uh, in our case as well, we have uh, tokens that are renewed every couple hours. So you can refresh the buckets uh, in whatever refresh interval you want. And then we created a, a permission setup. It's a first state, it's working fine for us, but yeah, uh, it has a lot of room to, to improvements and it can be completely customized for each use case. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I will show you a small demo. I have it running here. So yeah, uh, as soon as you install the front end and back end, you have this view, the S3 viewer, and you have two buckets uh, to give you an, an idea. Uh, I created this demo, which has two buckets, and then I insert these two folders inside. And yeah, if I go here, uh, I can see the buckets that are in each platform that I have defined in the config file. If I click, I see some information here about yeah, uh, the endpoint, the owner, uh, and this is information that it's not available in the API. So you have to add it with a different uh, customization. But yeah, you can access every data. You can download it, for an example. You go here, and this is the content. It's everything streamed, so uh, it's not using, uh, yeah, uh, you have a, a link down there and you can even copy and paste it and share it because there's another nice thing uh, that might help a lot. Uh, if you see here the URL, every time you change and click on something, uh, the URL changes so you can share it and the user doesn't have to check and do a lot of clicks to, to find the, the element. Uh, another thing we have is uh, for some images, if they are small enough for, yeah, for performance issues, uh, it can also be previewed and you have it here. Uh, there's also uh, a filter which is not a filter itself, but a, it's applying a search in the API. So if I write an F, it will filter all the files or folders that contain, now I start with F. And you can also, as it's a, a file explorer style, you can even click here and go back. And yeah, uh, you have both options and you can see whatever it's inside. You have more information about the files as well here. And yeah, this is more or less the basic implementation. And then I can show you a bit the code, the different things you can change. Uh, this is the, the configuration for the C plugin. Uh, as you see here, uh, there are some allowed buckets. Let's say, uh, for the platform two, instead of allowing this bucket, which is the one that is created, I say, I only allow this one. And as soon as it restarts, you will notice that that bucket will disappear. Take some time. And you see the other bucket, as it's not in a whitelist, has disappeared and as it was expected. And yeah, with the other one, you see I have a regex and it's fetching wherever it's there. And right now it's bucket one, but it could be bucket wherever you want or yeah, it's up to you. And then what else? Uh, this is the, the initialization of the, of the backend as i said you have multiple functions here so you can define different providers the the refresh interval this is for the permissions uh, you have more information about it in the in the readme file but basically the for the permission setup uh, as we are using the streaming uh, is it was trickier than we expected to 
to allow this request to download data. And we needed to use a, a middleware to apply a cookie. And then it uses that cookie to authenticate the user. And yeah, uh, I can show you the permissions. Right now, uh, I have some, a couple examples here. It's a basic permission policy. Right now it's allowing everything, but let's say uh, for security reasons, you only allow the, the users to navigate, but does don't download or review data. So you have this block, I can explain it a bit. First, we have a, a S3 viewer source type as the catalog. Uh, so it checks that it's concretely this kind of permission. And then the S3 viewer has four different permissions. You can see them here. There's a, a bucket list. So this one allows to see the, the one, the thing on the left. So the buckets that are listed for each platform. Then we have the bucket read, which is the actual navigation with all the information inside. And then we have two for the objects, one for read, which is displaying the, the information about the object. So, so to say the size, the location and things. And then the download, which is yeah, downloading or previewing the data. So right now with this example, uh, we are allowing everything except for the download. So if I save it and let it download, restart, yeah. If I go back here, seems to be everything working as before, but if I click download, I get a not, not, not allowed error because you have no permissions to do so. And also if I go back and I try to see a, a image that was before, displayed now I cannot see it and if I check the the response it's uh, not allowed error but as this is an image uh, it shows the the yeah the but, um, well you know the SRC thing you define the react and yeah uh, I have another example because we also allow with the permissions to use conditional permissions we have uh, this function. Uh, it's uh, all these functions for the permissions are defined in the uh, common package. So the common package contains basically the permission setup and the uh, and some types. But these types are mostly used in the in internally. Yeah, they are not really needed. And then we have two special conditions. Uh, could be increased over the time, but for now we consider it's enough. And but anyways, you can create your own, of course. Uh, these two are the bucket name and the bucket owner. So you can say a conditional permission saying if the bucket is named bucket one, you have permissions to do everything. If not, it shouldn't be displayed. So if I save this example and I go here, you will only see the bucket one. The bucket two has disappeared. And you can do as in other cases, you have all the not, uh, any all, uh, any of, all of, uh, it's, this part is was a bit, getting some information about the playlist plugin because it also has something like this in the catalog so i follow the same idea as as in there and yeah you can also use the is bucket owner the owner is a i saw it here yeah if i set this owner i said and I save it. Now both of them will appear because this is a, a safe container and I cannot change the, I didn't change the bucket owner, so it will show both. So yeah, you see both of them are back here. And yeah, I think that's all I can show now. Uh, if you have any question, uh, I'm up to, to answer them. 
yeah in if you have any questions please uh, uh drop them in the chat i've also put uh put a link to the to the plugin first of all great work uh including the permissions framework uh inside of your your demo um that's uh really uh, uh good to see um and important of course when you talk about uh storage buckets like uh, like this now i was wondering um i haven't looked into the code yet but is would this be a good plugin to start with if you want to expand functionality to other buckets, for instance, uh, Azure Blob Storage or something? Or? Mm, yeah, I think uh, right now we only have one client, I, an API client for AWS. Uh, but yeah, you can. I think it's easy to to customize and add many other providers if if they are required. It was based on the. Yeah, as I said, the idea was getting the same structure as in the Kubernetes plugin. So I think it's easily customized. It's easy to add more more things there. Yeah. Hopefully somebody's watching and inspired and adding <laughs> add more <laughs> more buckets because this looks really really great. And I see that this is yet another way of uh, making life uh, life easier. Um, if you mm -hmm. want to dive into something, need that like to see if the output of one image is there and you download it, you can see it. It's really cool. Thank you so much. It's really great work. Um, and uh, if you're watching this, uh, please do check uh, check out uh, the, the plugin. And uh, uh, I take it that, uh, well, it's on GitHub. So people are yep. welcome probably to contribute to it if they want yeah, to. Yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This brings us to the end of this um, backstage community session for adopters. Um, next week, we have a new one, uh, which is the backstage contributor, uh, <laughs> backstage community sessions <laughs> for contributors. Um, we still have an open agenda. Uh, basically, until the day before it happens, you can just comment on the issue. The link is in the chat. Um, and I've also already pasted the link for next, week, uh, next month. Uh, adopter session. So if you're watching this and you're like, oh, I have something to demo, something to present, I want to discuss a certain topic, then feel free and add uh, anything that you want basically to the um, to the agenda of next month's community meetup. Um, both links are in the chat um, and it's just a comment and uh, uh, me or somebody else will reach out to you and ask you, hey, that's nice. And uh, before you know it, you're on the show, uh, like um, uh, many people can tell you and went before you. Thank you so much for uh, watching uh, this and being here and interacting in the chat. It's really always good to see these interactions. And um, yeah, I hope to see you either next week in the uh, backstage community session for contributors or next month in the adopter session. Have a great day, folks. Bye.